this was has done many amazing policy in these areas and uh, also has won the best deal with the paper and has given talks on crypto. But today, Casper is going to tell us something about the Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for having me here. Right, so this is based on this paper from Euro 22 with my postdoc, my statistics, it's also in August. And I guess the title is also really strong, really, to try to give this very slow introduction to one of the years, and then I'll try to give some more take to the last half of the talk. So if you already know a lot about this machine learning and you know, learning theory, maybe the beginning is a little slow, but you have more interesting details will come. Right? So what we're looking at in this work is we supervise learning, you take a binary classification. So somehow you get some input elements, that could be pictures, for instance, of either as the sums. And then uh, you also have associated labels, that's a label, that's a label, either cap, sign, and so forth. And then the goal is to take this, get some training data like this, somehow use it to train a classifier so that you can get a new image, but where you don't know the label, you should be able to output or predict what the label is. Uh, you should, of course, use the training data to, to find these similarities to images and do any classifier. And right, so this is the kind of design. And I guess in general, I would think of paper as coming from some domain X, for instance, all the images, or, uh, vectors, or the ID, or other samples. And the labels come from some output domain Y. And here, for binary justification, you think the output domain is just minus one and one. It's supposed to come from the set of the output. That's all right. And then what we're trying to learn is really some unknown type of function depth. So when you think of it as there is some function that we're trying to learn, it's a mapping from the input domain to the output domain. And here for simplicity, you could say it's a list of functions. So for every input element, there's a unique output label. You could also consider setups where there's distribution over labels given here. Here, let's just keep it simple and say there's a unique deterministic mapping from the output. So it could be the correct mapping of images to well as pictures at that point. And then what we have right, is the training data consisting of these labeled examples, right? So we get M examples consisting of an input element and the corresponding evaluation of this unknown time function. We're told what the, the label is for this input element. Right? So we have all this training data available where we see evaluations of the unknown time function. And then from this, the goal is to output some hypothesis, which is just a function mapping from the input domain to the output domain. And then ideally, we would like this. Hypothesis that we produce is as close as possible to the unknown type of function. No, I have not yet said what we mean by the close, but, but that's the general idea. I want to find some function that's close to this unknown type that, that it's assigning the labels. Okay. So maybe drawn in the picture, it looks like this, right? There's an unknown type of function on the left from it. Get these training examples and the evaluations of the type of function. We feed it into a learning algorithm. And then the learning algorithm somehow there's a set of possible hypotheses that's allowed to output from. And so it outputs something, and the hope is that this hypothesis that produces those stuff like the unknown type function. And right, so here I guess the unknown type function could be this mapping of images to pets or sons, the training data could be these four examples. And then typically what the learning algorithm is doing right, is typically finding a hypothesis in this hypothesis set that gets most of the training labels correct, right? Because here we can verify many hypotheses. Look at the train there, evaluate it on the input element, and see whether it matches, matches the label because we know all the labels. Right? So this is the typical strategy. You're trying to find something that does well on the training there, and then you hope that this needs to also do well on the new data. So, of course, one has to specify what is this hypothesis that we're searching through, and I guess one also has to give a formal definition of what we mean by this hypothesis looking a lot like the unknown time function. So just to give a, one example to have in mind, what the hypothesis said, could think of the hypothesis as being linear models like squad data here, input data would be d-dimensional vectors, real numbers, so we have some d-numeric values that we measure from the elements. This could be the brightness of every pixel plus an image or something else. And then the hypothesis set that we produce could perhaps be all hyperplanes, right? So when you hyperplane, you return plus one on one side and minus one on the other side. And the hypothesis all across the hypothesis. It would be a valid choice of hypothesis. It could also be all neural nets with a fixed architecture or many of them. Here we try to just think of maybe uh, hypothesis choice. Yeah. 
then there's also the second part what we want to say, uh, what we mean by the output hypothesis being close to the unknown target function. And you will use the notion of pack learning or probably a function of learning. So uh, the idea here is that we want to somehow say that the new data that we want to evaluate the hypothesis on is going to look a lot like the training data, right? which gives us some hope that we can actually make accurate predictions on the new data if we perform well on the training program. So here to be formal, we say that there's some data distribution that we don't know. There's an unknown distribution D over the input domain. And then the training data consists of MIIG samples with sample the element XI from this distribution D, and then we see XI at the evaluation of the unknown target function. So we assume that the data is given to us this, this way. And also the new data that we have to make predictions on, that it also comes from this distribution D, meaning and our overall goal is to find a hypothesis so that the error of this hypothesis under the distribution D is as small as possible. Right? So, this is the probability of getting a new sample from D that you can get the label wrong when you use this hypothesis. Right? That's the error of the hypothesis under D. And this is what we'd like to try and minimize use the training data to somehow find a hypothesis with a small chance of making a mistake in the new one. Right? So, that's basically all this picture. Is the unknown input distribution that generates H1 to XM as IID samples. We see the evaluations of that. And then also, when we want to say that this output looks a lot like it, we, what we really mean is that the error of this distribution is as close to zero as possible. So, there's a very small chance of mispredicting this. So, there's a tag learning that several different setups you can consider it in. And I guess the simplest one is it's realized in the case. It's called. So, so here we assume that the unknown target function f also lies in the hypothesis at h. Right, so what does that mean? It means, for instance, for these linear models before, what we're assuming is that actually there is some type of label that will always give the right labels, right? So any label is a statistic function, and so the label is always whatever side of this hyperplane uh, that the point side sits on. Okay. So in this case, right, what it is really gives us is that. No matter what training data set I get, for instance, the one up here, I can always find the hypothesis that gives all the labels correct on my training data. Right? Simply because the unknown tax function is in there, right? So there's at least one hypothesis that gets everything correct. Um, but also, well, there could be many. In this example, right, you could also uh, train this by this hypothesis. It's almost the same as the unknown tax function. At least they agree on the label of all the training data. Uh, but maybe you know, if you find a point, get a new step in between them, you'll make a mistake. They look a lot alike, but they're not necessarily the same. So, I guess one of the most classic results in this area of the expected behavior is it talks about, so let me try to go on this story, there's a lot of parameters. So, so it's, we want to argue that this hypothesis that we produce, the hypothesis that we produce, has a small error under this distribution. We want to argue. There is a most epsilon, and then it, it talks about how many samples do we need before we can uh, trust in this happens, right? So there's also a probability delta here. So, so what I'm saying is if I get a training data set with high probability, so it's one minus delta over getting the training data set. If I have any hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on the training data, then all those, if I look at any one of them, its performance under these. Uh, it's also great, but it has error most epsilon. What this really means is that if I want a good algorithm for uh, uh, finding a good hypothesis, the only thing I should do is just I get my training data, I find some hypothesis that gets all the labels correct, and I output it. And then this is already telling me that in high probability over the training data, I'm going to output something that's error under these most epsilon. So at the moment, you are still talking about the Bochinia case about hyperplane. Yeah, I guess this holds for any uh, setup where we just realize in the case that uh, the unknown type of function lies in the yeah. hypothesis. In some hypothesis set of, I guess, it's <laughs> really yeah. yeah. So the reason, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Right, so that's the number of training samples you need to guarantee this one minus those and get start depends on the so called VC dimension of the hypothesis set. I just remind you on the next slide of these dimensions I haven't seen it before. I guess there are common parameters here that are important by this. Uh, 
one over epsilon dependency on yeah, I guess the precision epsilon, right? This least dimension is log over epsilon. And you have this other term log over this. So you want you to think of this uh, delta is, you know, sometimes you're unlucky and you just get a training data set that's uh, not representative of the distribution. Right? Maybe in the extreme case, you just get a lot of copies at the same point, but then you can't really do something like that. So there's some small chance of being uh, unlucky in the training. So this is tight, right? So you can ask uh, what it, uh, could, could, could it could it maybe give a better analysis and show that uh, it suffices with even fewer samples to get the steps one knows guaranteed. And it, it can be shown that you no, know, there are other examples of distributions, and I thought this is said at this convention here, where you need to spend samples because this is this is tight in general terms. Just the easy dimension just to make sure that uh, it's a so the VC dimension of the hypothesis that makes us all the linear models is defined as following is the D such that the set of D samples that can be shattered by the hypothesis set and no set of D plus one samples can be shattered. Then what is shattering? So shattering D samples means that this hypothesis set, no matter how I choose to label the D samples, I can find a, a hypothesis set that realizes that labeling. And so maybe just a small example. So let's say our input is R1, right? So every element has just one value, so we're sitting on the real line. And let's say that the hypothesis all the higher planes in, in 1D. And I guess a higher plane in 1D is I give you a value, and then on one side it can to a plus one, and the other side it to a minus one. And that's obviously 1D. So here we say, okay, so can I share two points? So if I have two points in 1D, I can start that I can create all the four different labels. And in this example, right, I, I can write it in this hyperplane, that one, that one. So it's possible to create all four labels here. So we can indeed share a set of two points with this hypothesis set. On the other hand, if I had any three points, I could always order them on the line and then I ask for the label. This is it's red or minus one here, one minus one. And this is impossible to realize with any hyperplane. So no matter what three points I have, it's not possible to. To share them. So, therefore, the VC dimension of hyperplanes in R1 is, is 2, and in general, the D dimension is T plus 1. So, and the samples on the previous slide, the number of trace samples we need grows linearly with the VC dimension of these hypotheses. So, but then, this is the issue that what do I do with my Unknown time function is not in this hypothesis set that I'm outputting hypothesis from. Right? So maybe there's no line that perfectly classifies the training data. So then I, there are a couple of different things I could, I could try instead. So one of them is what's called agnostic learning. So here, I guess you don't assume that the unknown time function lies in the hypothesis set. Uh, but what you instead do is to say, well, there's some hypothesis H star in the hypothesis that has the best possible performance under this distribution. Right? So there's someone that's the best one. And now the goal of my learning algorithm is just to find someone who's almost as good. Right? So I'm going to find a hypothesis H whose performance is not more than epsilon worse than the best one I could have chosen. So this is like an agnostic case. And you know, this is now maybe sometimes this is. Uh, which strategy to take? And I guess other times, maybe there's just no hypothesis in here that does great, right? In this, in this example of here with the, the points that no matter what line I choose, it's not going to be great. It's going to get quite a large concentration of data. Uh, so, what could I do if I wanted to do better? I guess there's like one more classic approach, which is the one I'll focus on here. It's uh, called the Greek Strong Learning. So, I'll try to use that. And I'll make a little less. Well known with the others. So, the idea here is that you have something called a weak learner. So, a weak learner is basically informally something that does a little bit better than guessing. Uh, when, you, when you train it, it gets more than 50% of the units correct, but it's perhaps not that much more. Okay, think of this example over there, right? It's, it's not 50 50, but it's, uh, it, it's a little bit better than that. Now, a strong learner is basically a classifier that. You get arbitrarily high accuracy to make the epsilon as far as you want, as long as you have enough training data. So it's almost like it is realized in the case, right? If you just have enough data, you can drive the error probability as far out as you want. That's a strong learner. 
then I guess the question is also a classic question that you guys think is fine is if I have one of these tweeters, can I somehow use it as a black box to construct a stronger? So can I boost the accuracy of the meter and use something that's arbitrarily good if I just have enough data available? And so to answer that question, I think we have to be formal about what the definitions are of weak and stronger. So, so here are the formal definitions. So a gamma weak learner is a learning algorithm such that no matter what the data distribution is, as long as I see enough samples, for instance, zero cumulative is a constant, I see at least M0 samples, then my algorithm with constant probability is going to output something that's better than guessing. Right? It's going to have an error of at most half minus gamma, so gamma is kind of like an advantage for guessing. So if I just give it enough samples, it's going to do a little bit better than guessing. That's the deep learner. And now a, an epsilon does a strong learner is one that no matter what the data distribution is, I can make the error as small as epsilon would probably use one minus tensor of the training data as long as I have some function of epsilon and those many samples, right? So if I give it enough samples, I can make the accuracy arbitrarily good. So, so the question is, can you always take such a weak number and turn it into a strong number? And this was answered uh, a long time ago. I guess one classic example of that would be does this and uh, which basically uses a strong number from weak and there are also algorithms before that did it, but this, I think this is the most famous example of such an algorithm that takes a weak number and turn it into a strong number. So maybe let me just say a little bit about what is that. So what does Oedipus do? So the basic idea is I have this weak learner A, I just have a little bit of output that's a little bit better than guessing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run it multiple times. And every time I run it, I run it on a reweighted version of the training data. So I put some kind of like some weights and say these points are more important and it's less important. Then I ask the weak learner to produce a hypothesis that's a little bit better than guessing under this weighting of data set, right? So at least cost more and then make a mistake. And I guess here it's important that the definition for weak learner says no matter what data distribution I have, I can get an advantage over guessing. Which means that no matter how I weigh data, I can get it, I can get better than a chance on this weighting of data set. That's the important part. So you, you run it two times producing these hypotheses, H1 to H2, and then you compute some weights somehow, alpha one to alpha t, and then the final classifier that you output is a majority vote. Or all the ones with the training, right? Where you have some weight of the two people hypothesis, right? So it's kind of like a weighted majority. So with some of the predictions of all these individual hypotheses, weighted by this alpha, you take a majority. In this case, it's just, it's just a sign by form one. Of course, there's some details, you know, how we choose the weights in each round of, of this uh, algorithm, the weights of the data points. And the basic idea is that, well, if I, if I misclassify the one, I put a large weight on it. And if I already have it classified correctly, I'll put a small weight on it. It's a basic idea, right? So you change the weights all the time. And these weights alpha I have chosen somehow proportion to how well did this hypothesis do on this weighted data set. So I don't want to give the details, but I'll just show you some simple illustration at this point. So let's say that the hypothesis is set here. Now let's say you have uh, points in 2D. Data set of two features, x coordinate and y coordinate. And let's say your you're learning algorithm is your last train, so called decision stump, right? So that's decision tree with one root and two children. So you can ask one question, either like either you compare the first feature to some value or the second feature to some value. And this gives you like the hypothesis, like do this either vertical split or horizontal split, and then on each side of the split, you can return either plus one or minus. So let's say this is your hypothesis set. And maybe this is your training data here, right? So you have some training data. And as you can see, there's no vertical or horizontal split that gets everything correct. Then you can try to run edit loops on this. So in the first round, you just have a uniform weight on the points, and you just try to look for hypothesis that does well on, on this data here. So maybe you compute this bit by it gets everything correct except those two blue points on the top. Then the edit boost puts a new weight, right? So once the this classifies gets a larger weight and the blue ones, and then puts a smaller weight on, on the other ones. <coughs> then you have the new data, and then you run one more iteration and you find a new hypothesis that uh, there's a very good or something split that does well here. 
So maybe this one is the best you can find. So it gets these three small red points in the middle wrong, but then everything else is correct. So then you change the weights again, right? So the red ones there, they will get a larger weight. Everything else will get a smaller weight. Maybe it looks something like this, that once you got right, both of the times are super small, the weights now, the other ones are kind of large. Let's do one more round. This is probably the best bit when you get all the big ones correct. And you only made a mistake on, I guess, one red one over there, one stuff there. So let's stop with the elements for now. It computes some weights. <coughs> and then you can see, like, the majority, <coughs> what is it with the majority of weight predicts to ask its main prediction in different regions of the input, right? So if you ask it out here, right, all of them say blue. Majority is also blue. Same here, right? You only have the first one saying red, the others say, say blue, and so the weight majority is still blue. Over here, I have the, the, this one, we have the first two say red, and the last one say blue. So that's the red majority, and so forth, I see. And I see if you go over on the boxes, this is the kind of decision boundary that place, and here's all the tricky data for making this example, uh, which you couldn't do with a single screen. Okay, so this is, this is at a boost. Yeah, I guess the classic algorithm. So it kind of combines a lot of these weak learners into a strong, strong learner. So then the, the main question that we look at in our work is how many samples to function with from the delta do you need to question? Yeah, sorry, I just want to you understand the formula setup. Uh, increasing the weights, is that like sampling the same concept? It's, yeah, I guess you can think of it as this sort of large chance of sampling that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, so, so the main question we're looking at is you know, how many samples does it take uh, to get this epsilon delta that guarantee stronger? And there are a couple of parameters that it's depending on. Of course, it depends on epsilon and delta. It also depends on the gamma of the advanced reader or guessing. And it also depends on the least dimension of the hypothesis set that the reader not outputs from. So those are the parameters that go into the least dimension of the hypothesis set that the reader is using. The advantage gamma, the epsilon, and the delta. Those are the four parameters that we can So maybe we can start by looking at atoms and try to give an end wave argument for why that's the central next to that's the best analysis is given. So it's not a formal group, it's just a sketch of how one would try and analyze it. It can be made formal. Let's say edibles output some hypothesis stage. Right? So so what's the intuition for why for, for proof of how many samples? So there's one key property of Adam boost that's proved a long time ago. So I don't like how Adam boost. And that is if I have M training samples, if I run it for one over gamma squared log M expressions, then it's gonna get all the labels of the training data correct. This is important by the way that it chooses its weights and we use to prove that it's gonna get all of the correct after log M over gamma squared expressions. So it will perfectly classify all the three data. So what does this mean? So this is a little bit hand waving, but what it means is that if I look at the unknown target function, right? But the unknown target function is going to agree with some combination, like a majority of T simple hypotheses. It's going to agree with them on all the training data. So you can almost think of it as if we could realize the case. Right? The realizable cases where the unknown target function is in the hypothesis set that you're using. Except the hypothesis set now is not H, but it's this hypothesis set where you're allowed to combine a T simple hypothesis in a majority of both. This is kind of makes sense, right? It's almost, at least on the training data, it, it looks like it is actually in the, yeah, in the hypothesis set where you're allowed to combine T hypothesis. At least if you accept that this is roughly the case, then you can try you can almost plug into this classic uh, dimension of semi complexity bounds. So, so let's just pretend that this is the case that maybe it's the same as realized condition. Kind of make it formal. So, okay, then you can look at what is the least dimension of these voting classifiers where you're allowed to combine T simple hypotheses. So instead of just doing one, you can combine T and it roughly grows by effective T. It's also not completely formally correct, but it's essentially what happens, right? It grows with effects of T. Now, if you've seen these classic algorithms, what you typically do in learning theory, right? You bound the growth function of the hypothesis set. And at least if you, if you don't have weights on your hypothesis, you just combine 
T of them with the same uniform weight, the growth function grows close to the T in the exponent. So, so that is, is taken to. Yeah. But, but basically, think of it as if I combine T, the least that makes growth by the T. So if you plug all of that in and, and believe that this is just plug it into the classic results for regularly realizable case, you get the bound out of it. So, so this is the bound for learning with the realizable case, how many samples I need to get error epsilon for the equals one minus delta. My least dimension now is this D prime because I'm using a combination of T hypotheses in a majority mode. If I plug in D prime being T times D and T being one over R squared log M, get this long expression here. Right, so that's the least dimension of the single hypothesis set of the weak units out of the problem. It's one over gamma squared, that's log M there. And okay, and I guess the problem is that this is kind of like an over here, it's also over there. Now, doing the calculations, basically, you have to set this and you replace it by, but it's one way, it's one over gamma squared, it's kind of replace it by this. This is the same replacement you get. So, it's always a little hand wavy, but this is the same replacement you get at the end. And actually, this is the best analysis that is added. End up with this sample place. Like it may be the shape one of the terms here, but this is pretty much what's known about it. This is a bit of the sample place. Like maybe you can get rid of the key. Maybe you can get rid of the X time. One of them. This is pretty much it. So this uh, was, is a nasty expression. It doesn't look up to me at least. Uh, uh, or you can ask what you do to try and improve this now. So maybe you can come up with a boosting algorithm with just a few iterations. I think there are several works that try to show this cannot be done. At least I have a paper to build a platform that shows that die examples where you need one over gamma squared log m iterations to, to actually get all the training data that they need to need to combine that many analysis. And I guess there's also those low bound pattern with the bicycle case, though kind of says this formula is also about right. So, so it seems to be kind of tight analysis if you're going over this, these proof steps at least. And, and this is the best known analysis. So, so this is the sample basic right? item. Just want to get down to get an epsilon bills as formula so gamma weak So what are our results? So we get rid of both of those log lenses. So the key about at least is one or epsilon is the key or gamma squared, and this is dependent on the So that's the main result. And then also there's a mixed low bound. And so the new low bound saying that uh, this is tight. The low bound proof, and there's a room for uh, follow up work. Low bound proof does require that the least damage is somewhat large to bottom of gamma. Otherwise, it's both. And there might actually be some reasons on so nowhere uh, as a favorite star 21 that indicates that maybe it's possible to get a sample place that somehow has a tendency as what well, is a one over gamma to be 2d over d plus one. If you look carefully at it, this starts to be different from one over gamma squared precisely when our low bound stop over. So there's actually some chance, it's not an algorithm, uh, but there's some chance of using these ideas to actually do something better. In, um, D is very small compared to the problem. So, so there's a little bit of gap that's there at the bottom. In general, these are this is tied for the rest of the trade off samples. Yes, the lower bound is just an information theoretic argument. You know, if you don't see enough samples, no matter what the algorithm is, uh, like the chance that output something that works, like this next one, that's the is it's too small. Yeah. Uh, I, this is I think there's only like the top bound that I here. It's previously a lower bound. It's not that I know in terms of number of percent. I think it, yeah, I think the best amount is the first lower bound. Yeah. And then next is the lower bound. This one, this one. Okay. So I guess now I'll spend half the time to get the story. Now I'm going to try to show you what is our algorithm. No bound and the time to the Which one is really
Yeah, I would. I was told, you know, I think I was told, I've got a post it's the rest of the journalists. Yeah, <coughs> I think it's the portion of this one, like it's mentioned, the bills is mentioned on this in the south. So I guess it means that you're gonna, this is gonna dominate. You're gonna get that performance, except it probably is expensive smaller than it's not. These, these dimensions, like, okay, so it depends a lot. So I guess you don't wanna use this with, uh, about neural nets, right? They have a huge extent. So that's not the obvious place to move. But edibles is typically used together with neural nets, decision trees, and things like this. Well, I guess the linear model that we saw that is like the dimension of the number of inches. That's one of the D. Suppose the gamma is, I guess that the one over gamma is less than one person Yeah. So the yeah, I guess okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. I so all those deltas are annoying to carry around. Like, so the rest of the talk is hide them and everything that it says there, it's all with the probability one line still to all the same. Like, the formulas are just annoying. To so, then it's a little bit cleaner at least. It's D over epsilon gamma squared. That's the right. So, okay. So here's our new algorithm. It's actually very simple algorithm. Analyzing is just tricky. Uh, so, so we have some training data. Yes, and what do we do with it? So we start by creating different subsets of the training data. So we leave out some of the data, not three subsets, but some, some number of subsets and subsets of the data. And then for each of those subsets, we're gonna run edibles. So each of them we're gonna train one of those majority bonus on each every one of them. And then we're gonna so each of them is like this weighted majority over simple hypothesis. Then we're going to take them, and then we're going to do a majority over the edibles. <coughs> two level majority, majority, majority. Find out. So we train edibles to different substances with data, and the majority at the top. Of so of course, question, why does this help? Why is this great? Uh, I'll show you. And so that not too long, but I maybe can tell you at the end that you can actually replace it on sense. Yeah, uh, say that it's possible. Okay, so the, the basic idea is that we get the training data S, and then we're going to create a bunch of subsamples, this one to escape, run edibles to each of them to get these voting classifiers. They're all majority voters, and then we do another majority on top of them. The outer majority is, has no way, it's just a uniform way on all of them. So the question is, of course, how do we generate these subsamples and why does it help? And so I'll try to explain now what, how we get these subsamples. Right. And for that, <coughs> we'll get to reach strong learning for a second and go back to this pack learning in the realizable case. So, so remember, pack learning in the realizable case is where the unknown type function lies in hypothesis. That's the thing with linear models, is when it is a true hyperplane, uh, we promise that the unknown type function is a hyperplane. So, if we go back to this, right, there was this bound before we moved the delta C as well, right? But it basically said that if uh, I have this one register on times G, so it's long one register on many samples. Then anything that gets all the training labels correct will also have an error on most steps on the distribution. So, and there was a matching lower bound for this. Now, an interesting thing is that you can actually get around this lower bound from pack learning in the realizable case. And the thing is, you're promised that the unknown type function lies in the hypothesis at H, but you don't have to output a hypothesis from H, right? So, even though you know that if it's a linear model, it is actually corresponding to a hyperplane, maybe you can do better if you don't yourself out with something that's a hyperplane. And it, does, it doesn't sound intuitive that it should help to do something else, but you can actually get something from it. And this was done in 2016. Penny here showed, gave an algorithm that for pack learning in the realizable case, I need just D over epsilon samples. You say this log on where epsilon. You have an algorithm that outputs the hypothesis. And so this is not itself in H, it's just some hypothesis. Uh, where you, you save all the log on epsilon the number of samples you have to, have to actually output something uh, the license hypothesis. So output, outputting some of the license hypothesis is often called a bubble 
capabilities that the technology is going to develop. It's sort of nice in the same sense. But this is not what this one is doing. And this is actually optimal. So you can prove that low amounts to show that you can relax with no algorithm, no matter what it does, even if it's loud or output, arbitrary, it's not to do it. So, so the question is, of course, what is this algorithm doing? And we'll be using some of the ideas from this algorithm. So, so here's Hennig's algorithm. So it uses subsets. This subset is the data. And so this is also how we're going to do it. So let's try and see what it's doing. So he has him samples. <coughs> kind of all of them here are just actually all of the training data. And then he has this recursive procedure for constructing subsamples. That's what he's explaining what he's doing. So the basic idea is that you, you call this procedure with the first argument is S being the whole training data set, and the second argument is the empty set. And then it, it, it's trying to go over from the maps and see what's good. So I guess as a base case check, if the set is is less than four, we're done. This is not the case here, I've got 16 samples. So what we're going to do is we're going to partition the training data into four groups of equal size, get more four samples each. Then we're going to make three recursive calls here. So what are these recursive calls doing? So in all three of them, <laughs> the new S is just the first chunk of the data. And then the T is whatever T you had already, and you add something to it. So I'm trying to illustrate this. Okay. So the first call you add is two and is three, but not as one. The second one you leave out is two, and the last one you leave out is three. So if we look at this recursive call here, the first one, what this is doing is, is T is now, you take this two and this three, you leave out the S1, then you recurse with the S being this first one quarter of the data. So, so now with this data, I can again check I mean, the base case, not yet, but I'm just going to have four samples left. So we partition it into four pieces of equal size. Then we have three recursive calls again. The first one is leaving out S1. By adding S2 and S3 to T, right? So we add it to the T that we already constructed. Which means that now it's going to look like this, right? In the first call, so I add these samples to T. And now your S is just a single element in the beginning. Now you're in the base case, so you take your S, you take your T, and now you output this is the subsample. This is one of the subsamples that I'm constructing. So this is one, the pink thing here is one constructed subsample. See the outputs. Okay. But of course, this was only like one of the recursive calls from the path to the question. If you look at all of them, you're going to get all of these patterns here. Right? So think of like each group, there are three corresponds to one of the top level recursive calls. Right? So you leave out, out either as one, this is what's three. Then recursively, you leave out either as one, this is what's three. So nice. you bring all these carefully constructed subsets of the data. Okay. Uh, maybe you want, to, yeah, you want to know how many subsets are we creating. I guess the size of the data goes down by like four each time. You have three recursive calls. So you get something like three to the log base four of them. So again, to the 0 0.79. It's probably not many subsets. Linear size. In the this is all the ones it produces. And then, uh, yes, yeah, so basically, you leave out one chunk for every recursive middle. And his final algorithm is create all these subsamples. Now, for each of the subsamples, each of the big sets, you just run this basic algorithm, you just call it empirical risk and you just find something that gets all the labels correct from the string data. Just a naive thing that you would do in, in proper background. So you just find something that gets all the labels correct from the subsample, and finally you do the majority vote for all these things that you've trained, all these recursive calls. This is the final hypothesis. He creates the majority of each one to each nine. So, okay, so why does this help? I guess the proof is rather complicated. I'm trying to give the main ideas just to try and sketch what the ideas in the analysis is. Why is it a good idea to do this? So, it's one of the key observations. What you do is let's start by looking at one of the recursive calls here. You make one recursive call where you leave out this one, right? So this recursive call is going to generate a third of all the subsamples, right? So spit out a whole lot of subsamples. And all those subsamples, you're going to train a hypothesis on all of them. Right? And all of them, 
have left out all of this one. So I turned all other things that we left out intentionally one piece of the train there. So and now if you look at the, this call here, the important point is that this is also going to output a third of all the hypotheses, but all of these are going to include all of this one. So the same over there, right? All of those are also going to include all of this one. So, so what is this bias? So if you go back and look at the first recursive call here. So this outputs a whole lot of hypotheses. Right? And now let's try to look at this is a third of all the hypotheses. Right? Let's try to look at the majority amongst those ones. Right? Let's try to look at how well does the majority of these ones behave. You can say so, but let's say that the majority here fails to somehow be an error or something. The important point is you left out this one from the training there, right? which means that this one kind of acts like a test set, but it's still independent of the things that you train, like all the ones that you train, right? None of them were trained on this one. So all these samples are independent of whatever you choose to output in this recursive, all the hypotheses are out of Which means that if the majority of these are often there, you're going to see a lot of examples in this one where. Majority errors just by because the independence just by shun of have a strong concentration of how many mistakes you see in there. All right, so it's basically the, the idea is that if this has a high chance of making a mistake, you're going to see a lot of examples in this one where, where you have this. <laughs> now, the important point is that it's hard to look at one of those mistakes, right? Uh, so, if I'm telling you, if I'm just telling you these lightning bolts of where you make a mistake. I'm trying to look at what is the distribution of these training samples if all I tell you is that here the majority is wrong. And intuitively, these are still independent samples from the conditional distribution where I tell you that the majority of these ones are wrong. But that's the only thing I told you. I told you the majority of these are wrong. The distribution of them are from this conditional distribution. So, so basically, I'm, I'm getting a lot of samples from the distribution where these ones make mistakes. So now what do I do then? Then I look at these two other recursive calls. And again, all the ones that I output here were trained on all of this one. Okay? They <laughs> all of this one. Uh, and we're in this realizable case, right? So which means that anything I'm going to output here will be correct on all the training data that's given. Because you find something that's correct on everything. So in particular, it's going to be correct on the lightning bolts. So all these hypotheses, it's two thirds of all the hypotheses, they're going to be correct for the lightning bolts. So, and these lightning bolts were these independent samples from where this is one third is wrong. Okay, so now we can actually use this classic result for handling the realizable case. What does it say? I said that for any distribution B, if I have enough samples from this distribution, any hypothesis that gets all those samples correct, we have a small error under this distribution B. And now I use this condition distribution as my mean. And so what this is telling me intuitively is that these two thirds of all the hypotheses, they rarely make a mistake when the one third make a mistake. Does that make sense? Like I'm telling you, because I'm giving you a lot of samples for the one third makes mistakes. That means that the remaining two thirds will rarely make a mistake in the day. Since we're doing a majority, right? And one third that is wrong and two thirds that are correct, this is going to help you read your accuracy, right? This is the intuition, right? The chance that they both one of those things that and the majority of your next is small. Right? That's the intuition. That means you have to make it formal. Yeah, like it doesn't uh, not to prove all the way up this regression to be so that as you get closer and closer to the top, the error will get smaller and smaller. But this is the basic idea. The intuition is that these two thirds have been trained on the basis of the first one third is wrong, and it means that you can force them to have a small chance of making a mistake when the first one third makes a mistake. That's it. Kind of training them on the places where, where you make mistakes. In the okay. so, so the intuition is that by leaving out this data, kind of make sure that you have some samples, examples of where. One third is making mistakes so that you can make the remaining two thirds correct. That's the basic idea of this construction. Yeah. zero. Uh, I guess it's zero. So, in his construction for the recursive, I have to add all the way up to the 
other situation, and that comes in with PS0. Uh, just one level. That's it, it's kind of technical, yeah. I guess the, the point is, we, when you call this all the sort of category, you realize that you have this log of waves and text that wants to get rid of that is that it's off sub option by log of waves and text. And you, if you just had one level, you would not be able to kill that log of waves and text. It's kind of just yeah, I guess you can kind of say it's similar to the pool stick in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, 
going to build this thing. You can find the epsilon being one over 200, and all the epsilon go away in the organization. That's it. So it simplifies quite a lot. You can get rid of one of the large factors. We're plugging one over 200 here. And now we just have to multiply that with one over epsilon. This gives us our new bar. So just plugging in the hand wave analysis at the beginning gives us some. You can see it's already better than Adams, but it's one log factor better. This is log also better than this one. So we're almost there. We just have to give it one, one last log factor. And we appreciate one. So how do we get rid of the last one? We don't actually need to come up with a new algorithm. The algorithm is quite this. We just give a better analysis of Adams, but only in the case where epsilon one or two. So somehow there are a lot of reasons why our analysis only works if you're in constant. Analysis. So the previous Adams analysis has to be over gamma squared log here for gamma into n one over two hundred. We show that this log factor is not there in the Adams just for one over two hundred error of this gamma squared. And then if you plug that in, you just have to multiply that with one over epsilon. Uh, is there something special about one over two hundred? It's, it's just a small enough constant. Yeah, yeah, just any small enough constant. It's a constant that's good enough to make this analysis and it can scroll through. Yeah, it's always goes down. It's basically one. I think in this in this new work where you sample like there's not the same banging, it constant something like one over sixty thousand. So that's why you get more samples. Else, just gets more. Yeah, just some small enough constant. So I don't have time to go through this, but I maybe just show what I most to know about it. Just say what I'm doing is a bit of a problem. I don't think people want to know how to say it. But the basic idea is that we can say when it was below proves one of the more class types, then we're going to simplify them, we're going to approximate them by smaller ones with the difference in error probability is very small, like one over thousand, which is okay if we're aiming to prove error probability at one over two hundred and approximate by something. Terrible, small constant force. <coughs> but then these G prime have some nice structure. These G primes, in particular, is going to be a majority vote with no coefficients in them. Uh, they all have the same weight. And also, they're only going to combine all of one over gamma squared instead of one over gamma squared log in the two way, which is combine them all. Kind of approximated by some simple ones. Don't combine that many. But the uh, voting test files. And then there's an interesting property here that we somehow make use of. Like here we have like the average prediction of all those hypotheses that goes into the majority vote. This is basically before taking sign, how big is, the, is this prediction? Right? If it's all the way to one, they all agree that the limit is one. If it's all the way to minus one, they all agree that the limit is minus one. And if they're 50 50, that this is zero, but it's sometimes called the margin. That's fine. And somehow, what we show is that these two primes. If you look at a random sample, but it's very rare that they have small margins. Okay, so it's, it's the predictions before taking sign are often very far away from zero. That's somehow important in our proof. And this, for some reason, uses like an answer concentration to solve this deal with upper lemma. Kind of surprising to show up here. Basically, okay, the point is that random samples of, uh, I guess these hypotheses are a bit. You have some end concentration, so it's unlikely that you get very close to zero. And you combine all of those, uh, the classic way of analyzing uh, sample complexity things with bound BC dimension. If you see that this idea of sampling a ghost data set, uh, bound the growth number of the G primes, have to show that this growth number is small. And somehow there we use other complexity, and this property gives the conclusion for that part of the margins are very small. There's a bunch of technical details going on. It's not part of the algorithm. Yeah, that's so there's a lot of ingredients there. Um, <coughs> there was a key new idea. The top two ideas that appeared in previous conversation about code test bias. Our new idea is to try and force it. It's very rare that the margin is small, even if you start with something that has a small margin. That's so. So that's kind of the summary. If I get this new algorithm with one over epsilon d, one over gamma squared sample complexity, this is a nice low bound at least uh, when d is sufficiently large. It's about one over gamma. So there's still an open problem. I asked, can you get something similar to this? 
And I think actually for the, the information theory global, I'm probably one can actually use your results maybe yeah, to actually get a not computationally efficient way of getting a better sample, which I would guess that that's the case. Uh, yeah, probably there's no more. Maybe we then do a better algorithm or something that's actually not strong. Yeah. This type of a lower bound doesn't prove <coughs> No, it's a uh, we created an example of a classifier with some mission of the and some distribution of coordinates. Is that natural? Uh, the hypothesis set is okay, it's, a bit of, it's basically if you look at the you said the input domain is very small, it's not too large, uh, so it's a finite input domain. And then the hypothesis that go into this hypothesis set kind of it's a probabilistic argument because we put in random hypotheses <coughs> into it at random. Minus one once, like all the predictions are random, and it can show that with high probability, this is going to give you something where you can we learn a lot of different concepts from the small hypothesis. So that's basically the idea. We learn a lot of different things, then your algorithm basically needs to uh, see all the elements in the universe before getting higher. It's kind of like those are the kind of ideas, but it's a random hypothesis that all the predictions are, are chosen randomly. I think actually our like the, the universe that we're looking at is so small that maybe you could replace it even by like a linear model with sufficiently large dimension. I think that that can also work. I guess, yeah, many models in that in just as many dimensions as the size of or the uh, And it's not very large in the size of the universe. So I think it's, I think actually the universe size is something like, like this, like it actually D over half square is around the size of this. But I would I guess in the each dimension of the I would think it's also bring it up. And then I don't know, maybe that's not very it's a good question, maybe to find it the examples. So the the living would offer you you just need to one of the square root to be able to the precise No, just the one of the square root, yeah, yeah. So maybe there are other simple ways to do it. But maybe the sigma to some people also. Oh, no, yeah, I actually think we, we, uh, not, yeah, we don't need the precision in it. Uh, there's some good read. I guess it's some interesting points. Okay, so maybe trying to do pain sigma actually doesn't work. Okay, so let's, maybe let's take it off as no boy. Or yeah. Yeah. Was that, a, that was not a question. Okay. No, but that, uh, I guess, is, is it. And my poster made this bigger. Majority of majorities is. Uh, Okay, so I think it may be a very good open question is do you need a majority of majorities to do optimal here? Right? Would you maybe you may do some some boosting out of the light atoms? We only have one level of majority. Or maybe you can give a better analysis of atom boost. Uh, so we look at this question and we managed to show that atom boost actually plays at least one of the log factor, right? there was an upper bound in the analysis, there was one lower bound. We managed to show that atom boost is not optimal. But we proved we tried to prove that anything that's just the the majority of the suboptimal, you couldn't prove that. So, uh, maybe there's uh, ways to make a simple majority. So, uh, I think that's an interesting So, is this algorithm the best likely to work with the normal? I, I guess theoretically it is right that it needs to prove 